Hey everyone, I'm thinking about bringing back the more frequent vlogs, partially because I have no more vacation left this year, and also in the summer, they're very easy and enjoyable to make. In today's episode, I'll show you the more advanced version of the backend architecture that I've been working on for my analytics project, and then I'll kindly ask you to help me choose the technology to implement and deploy it. And also, I have some hot takes on today's state of affairs when it comes to backend. But let's navigate the crowd here and grab a seat at one of my favorite favorite coffee places. Some of you have been asking me to make another vlog there, so today is that day. This place is called Porsche Studio Supreme Roastworks, and they always have a cool car on display, a true crowd pleaser. I'm taking my daily allowance of caffeine, but anyway, before I can show you the architecture of my project, technically it's still working hours, and I have to do some more work for my day job, which is surprisingly fun these days. I've been contributing more and more to product design, for better or for worse, but it's very different from my typical day as a backend engineer. Oh, and I have to show you this. I've been looking at the link clicks in my video descriptions and also at my Amazon affiliate earnings, and so far I've made negative profit. <laughs> If there's anyone in the audience who can tell me how the frick this is possible, I'm all ears. So just a quick recap, my project is an analytics platform, kind of like Google Analytics or Amplitude, but simpler, easier to use and focused on privacy. So let me walk you through all the components. Okay, so we're starting from the traffic coming from the internet and it's going into what I'm calling the catch-all Kafka writer. It's a pretty dumb stateless component that filters out the well-known bots, spammers, and everything else that we for sure don't want in our analytics pipeline. It also enriches the data with like geo information and other data points that we get from the request itself. From there, it pushes everything into a ginormous Kafka queue. Listening on this Kafka queue is the ingress, which is a stateful component that will do further rate limiting per customer. And it will also be aware of the configuration and the kind of events the customers are interested interested in in the first place so that we can validate and further trim down the amount of data that we are saving in our analytics database. Speaking of saving the data, first it will go into a backup service that will store everything in some kind of like cold storage, maybe S3, and it will also provide a way to restore it back into the analytics service. The analytics service itself will store all the events into ClickHouse, which will be the main analytical workload database, but it will also have a smaller configuration database. and this configuration will come from the dashboard service, which is actually the user facing part of my platform. The dashboard is where the user can make all the charts, configure the widgets and everything else. And this configuration data will be translated into queries that the analytics service will run so that it can return the stats to the dashboard. And I'm also thinking about using Hasura for the dashboard database itself to make it easier to implement the basic create, read, update and delete operations. And that's pretty much it. That's the whole architecture that I currently have in mind, but I have lots of doubt on how to actually host and implement these services individually. So I took a bit of time to put on the canvas the top level requirements and list out some of the options. But then I noticed that the coffee shop was actually starting to close, so I had to pick up my stuff and go. That's one weird thing about the summer in Norway. Days last forever, well after 9 p.m. and yet everything closes at like 5 or 6. But anyway, let me get home real quick and I'll present the options I'm thinking about when it comes to different languages and ways to deploy this backend. By the way, this episode is sponsored by Miro, which is the diagramming app that I'm using, so check out the link in the description. And in the meantime, I reorganized the board a bit and I added a few more things I found interesting related to choosing the right language for the project. So let me show you what I got. So let's start with the languages. First off, TypeScript. Um, this is the language that I've been using most for my personal projects. But TypeScript, you know, because of JavaScript, is kind of slow comparing to like the compiled languages. So then from there, I looked into Go. And Go is new to me, but people on Discord actually recommended it to me. And I was like, okay, let me let me take a look here. And I must say that I really like the overall approach that Go is taking towards a programming language, meaning it's meant to be simple and obvious. And also, 
it's very, very fast, not just runtime, but it's also very fast to build and compile. However, there are things that I didn't really like about Go. One of the major ones is the way you can sort of define your tags for the struct properties. And I was really disappointed by this because it's a very important feature. This is what you use to define your JSON serialization and deserialization, and also some other things like if the property is required. But to me, this seems like a very low effort type of implementation. I actually tried to see if this a string is interpreted or compiled or type checked at compile time, and it's not the case. So basically, it's very easy to make like typos and stupid errors like that. And it's not very clear what the syntax is. I saw some people put commas here, some people put spaces, and I don't really like this part. Other than that, I really like the Go channels and combined with Go routines, the way you can write asynchronous code. I think it's really, really simple and well implemented. Then people also mentioned that I should get with the times and actually learn Rust. So I've been doing a little bit of research about Rust and I found that the language is very complicated. Although it's very fast and a lot of people are citing some really crazy performance, I don't personally like it that much. There are some really great things about it. For example, in the diesel library, which is used to create like SQL queries and, you know, connect to the database and things like that. I found this to be a very elegant syntax and quite compelling. For example, the way it's able to generate this very clean SQL query, which I assume is also very type safe here. On the other hand, I really don't like the way Rust allows so much freedom and flexibility when it comes to the macro system. And let me show you this example with the warp package, which is like a web framework. Like for example, take a look at this macro, which introduces like a completely new syntax for defining your routes. And I have a problem with this because, you know, I've heard things on the internet about Rust, such as Rust will never need a version two because any feature you need in the language you can implement with a macros. And that's really great. But my personal opinion is that not everybody who's followed a few tutorials on Rust is qualified to make new language features. And I can see this already happening here with this crazy syntax that we have. I mean, this might seem like unassuming, but imagine you have like 10, 20 different libraries in your project and each one introduces like a new operator or part of the syntax. All of a sudden you end up with something like Scala, which is like a super over-engineered language in my opinion. So this is the part about Rust that really scares me, although I really like the type safety, I like the compiler, and I really like the performance. On the other hand, speaking about the compiler and the type safety, sometimes I feel like they are overdoing it a little bit. Just take a look at this example with like so many chained unwrappings and like casting to string and whatever this is, it's like a reference to a slice or whatever. And here again, another unwrapping, like it seems a little clunky, not very intuitive, not very easy to read. Okay, and moving on. So we have Java. And I already mentioned that I don't like Go's tags for defining metadata about properties. But I think this is one of the areas that Java really gets right. For example, the attributes are first class citizens, they are type checked at compile time, and it's very easy and uniform across many different Java code bases. And therefore, it's very easy to learn. In addition to being able to annotate your endpoints, you can also annotate properties and even put validation metadata about them. And it's very, very convenient. On the other hand, I don't really like Java's type system. I think it's a little outdated at this point. Like we all know the null pointer exception. And I know Kotlin is making like some strides to fix these kinds of things. But even so, the build system is also archaic and very difficult to reason about. Like don't get me started about Gradle, all the different tasks, the settings Gradle, the build Gradle. I mean, all these little configuration files. And with Maven, I'm never really sure what the output of the build is going to be. Is it going to include the dependencies? Is it not going to be? It's very confusing. And I think for that reason, I don't really like Java, even though I use it every day at my day job. Okay, so this basically concludes the languages. And now let's talk a little bit about deployments. So obviously everybody's using Kubernetes today, but I found that first of all, Kubernetes is not simple. It takes a lot of time to master and using all these YAML templates is not making it easier by any means. Because not only is YAML itself very prone to typos and like white space issues, you get into these like really weird looking uh, files. They're not type checked again. You get almost no auto completion and you kind of have to remember all of this stuff. And it's very, very confusing and it introduces a lot of anxiety when you're just trying to get something deployed and you're never sure if your templates are right. 
I mean, for example, this is straight from the official documentation where they say like, oh, blocks such as control structures may be indented to indicate flow of the templated code. But then, however, since YAML is white space oriented language, it is often not possible for code and on and on with these issues. And this is something that really bothers me. In addition to that, Kubernetes can be expensive. And I wrote that because any Kubernetes cluster needs at least a few nodes if it's even going to make sense for you. And then I also found some articles where they say that just running Kubernetes alone takes about 20% of your overall performance. And I think 20% of performance is a very steep price to pay, given that you're not actually getting any services to go with that. Like Kubernetes doesn't really provide log collection. It's not a platform as a service. It's just the deployment layer and to take 20% performance hit just because you want to deploy with some YAML files to me doesn't really make a lot of sense. Moving from Kubernetes, which is uh, very complicated, I think the simplest option when it comes to deployment is obviously serverless. But with serverless, you have other issues. For example, one of my main requirements is that you can self host this entire application. And if you're using serverless, obviously you can self host because you're dependent on, for example, different platforms like Cloudflare workers, which really deploy things at the edge. But one big unknown for me when it comes to serverless is whether or not this is GDPR compliant, because I'm building an analytics application. And one of the core requirements is that it's GDPR compliant. And it's kind of difficult to say if your like edge function is running on a US server, whether or not that's GDPR compliant, I'm not really sure. And then finally, you have the classic option, which is the VPC, which is virtual private cloud. And there's a lot of these providers, both in Europe and in the US. However, this option is not simple. You have to know your way around networking. You have to understand different ways that these different providers are working. Some of them like OVH is compatible with the open API spec. Hetzner, for example, is not. And one of the big reasons why I'm looking for a European based a hosting provider is that actually Google Analytics is illegal in Europe. And this is because any US based provider that has servers that store European customers data in the US is obliged by law to reveal this data to US authorities if they so require. And then this violates the GDPR compliance and things become illegal in Europe very, very quickly. So for that reason, I'm not able to use platforms like Roku. And I would kind of have to think about how to deploy things on a VPC myself, how to make it scalable and automated. I'm really kind of stuck with options here. So if you guys have any recommendations here, this is all that I'm trying to reason about at this moment. And I know that some of you may disagree and will tell me that Rust is an excellent language. Maybe JavaScript is not that slow as I think it's going to be. So I'm really looking forward to hear your opinions. And yeah, this is going to be like one of the major things I have to decide before I actually start implementing the backend. All right, I'm going to continue playing with Rust here to see if I'm going to be able to figure out the basics. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to hit the like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.